Hi folks, it's good to be with you today. We're at Manchester Evangelical Fellowship. We're just getting into the Word. And welcome. God bless you. Don't forget, you can get me on jasonbirdspreacher.com, Facebook and Twitter. It's good to be with you. And we're carrying on from what we did last week. And we was in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 to 14. And today, we're in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 to the end of the chapter. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and um, I'm going to pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the Bible study. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace. Father, we pray that you might bless us immeasurably with your power, that you might encourage all of us as we look at your word. Strengthen those who will hear your word and bless them mightily in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're reading from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15 and that's where we've got up to so far. So I'll, I'll, I'll do you want me to read the, chap, the, the rest of the chapter? Okay. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you making mention of you. Do you want to use this one? Eh? That's, that's got the there okay that's got the chapter in there it's a bit ripped on it so I'll wait, I'll wait till you get it sorry about this folks this is just Bible's been ripped and we on the Ephesians passage, so we're just using another Bible. So we will begin. So, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. It says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in our prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And to put all things under his feet, and give him to be the head over all things, to the church, which is the body of the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now today, we're doing uh, expository Bible teaching, expository Bible teaching, which means what, that we're going to expound the passage bit by bit. And um, we've done from verse 1 to verse uh, 14, but today we're only going to be doing verse 15 and 16, and we're going to be looking at the issue of prayer in Paul's life, the Pauline prayers. That's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, today so we're only going to be looking at verse 15 and 16 which is the beginning of Paul's prayer so he says wherefore I also have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love all love unto all the saints now when he says there wherefore I also after I heard of your faith what does it mean faith what does it mean faith well uh, people say oh well we, we need to look at the Greek well first of all we need to remember that that when the apostles wrote they were steeped in the Old Testament they were steeped in the Hebrew Old Testament so when we're looking at the the concept of faith we've got to understand that of the Old Testament is that a fair thing to say? 
Yeah. And the concept of faith in the Old Testament is a, a, a faith in the steadfastness of God, that God is steadfast. So when it says, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith, the idea is that God is steadfast. And it's God who gives us the faith. It's God who uh, gives us the strength in our faith. It, it, it's faith in the Lord, but it's a faith that's steadfast from the Lord. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that so we we got to understand that before we even get to the Greek, we got to understand that it's from we, there's the steeped in the Old Testament, you know. It's because this is written in uh, I can't pronounce it, but Kaon Kaon Kain, what's it called? Kainoin Greek. Kainoin. It's not Kainoin. Kainoin Kainoin Greek or something like that. But we've got to understand the Old Testament roots of the Greek. Yeah. So wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith, that is the faith that God has given them to be faithful, to trust in the Lord. Wherefore I also, after I have heard of your faith, verse 15, uh, Philipp, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love all unto all the saints. Now, what is significant about the word saints there? Any thoughts? What is the significance about the word saints there? Those who have faith. Yeah, yeah. All saints. That's good, yeah. We live in a, a secular society which is about I, I, I. But if you notice, the, most of the time, 90.99% .9 of the time, when the word saint is used, it's used in the plural. The, the, the early church thought in terms of community, that we're not just individuals. When, when Adam and Eve fell, sin came in, and sin is I, 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 what I want. But when we get redeemed, it's not about I, it's about others thinking of the community, willing to serve the community, willing to give your life for the community. So when it says, unto all the saints, people are seen by God as a community. And the community is seen as a community, not a collection of individuals doing their own thing, being selfish, but a collection of people who are living for each other, serving each other. So that's what it means to be saints. It means to be redeemed in, in a community together. You know, so the question is, you know, when, when, when we're in church, is it all about me, 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 my needs, what I want? Or do we realize that we're a part of a community and in that community we're to protect that community, defend that community, serve that community, love that community? It's amazing, isn't it? So... That's verse 15. Now, we're just going to expand verse 16 by looking now at Paul's prayers. That's what we're going to do tonight. That's what we're going to do. This was just a little introduction. Do you want to say anything? Anybody want to say anything? Yeah. Okay. It says, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So I, I want you to get your Bible out now because we're going to do a Bible study of looking at Paul's prayers and there's so many of them that uh, we won't have time to do them tonight. So we're going to do half an hour now of looking at Paul's prayers. So get your Bible out, get your pen out and make notes because we're going to look at a lot of verses. So let's see, let's look at Paul's prayer life. We're just expounding verse 16 tonight. And we're going to look at Paul's prayer life. So, let's look at Paul's prayers. That's what we're going to look at tonight. So, let's, let's look at the richness and the variety of Paul's prayers. So, let's look at Romans chapter 1 verse 8 and 10. Are you okay with this? Romans chapter 1 verse 8 and 10. 
So we've got a, a lot of prayers, so get your Bible out and get a pen and paper and make some notes. And meditate over Paul's prayers. Romans chapter 1, verse 8 and 10. Do you want to read it or should I read it? Okay. It says, First I thank my God, through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve in my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. So what is in the prayer there? Any thoughts? Thankfulness, first of all. Yep, yeah, thankfulness. I thank my God for Jesus Christ for you all. So basically, would you agree with me that he's thanking God for the converts that they have a faith and they're walking with the Lord? So here's a question. How much do we thank the Lord for new converts? How much are we praying for new converts? Paul was constantly praying for them. And then is there anything else that we see in that prayer? Well, the faith was so great, it was spoken of throughout the world. So that's amazing. So Paul is thanking them because God was working in them to the point where their faith was known throughout the whole world. So that's amazing. But he says in verse 10, making requested by any means now at length I might, means now at length, have a prosperous journey. So he's praying that God would help him to have a journey to be able to help them. Would you agree with that? So, so, you know, let's pray that God will send us to people to encourage people and that would be a blessing to people. So let's look at Romans 10.1. Romans 10.1. So we've got a lot of prayers to look at. And uh, I don't think we'll cover them all tonight. Romans 10.1. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So he's praying for, would you agree, he's praying for the nation of Israel there. So he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So Paul is praying for Israel. I think that's pretty significant, isn't it? That he's praying for Israel. So the question is, how many of us are praying for Israel? That they might be saved, that they might come to know the Lord, that they might come to know their Messiah. So are we praying for Israel? Romans 12, 12. It says, Romans 12, 12, it says, Rejoicing in hope, patience in tribulation, continuing diligently in prayer. So Paul was diligent in prayer. That's amazing. So are we diligent in prayer? Romans 15, 5 and 6. Romans 15. <coughs> Romans 15, 5 and 6. Romans 15, 5 and 6. So get your Bible up. And your pen and you and make some notes okay Romans 15 verse 5 and 6 now the God of patience and consolation grant to be like-minded one towards another according to Christ Jesus that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ so God is praying uh, Paul is praying that people would be united that people would be united. So, are we praying for unity amongst God's people? What? Any thoughts? Well, if we are, we glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 6. If we're united in one mind, we glorify God. It's quiet. 
a challenge that, isn't it? That so if we're not if we're not united, we're not glorifying God. Yeah. So if we're not united, it, it says here, if we're united, it brings glory to the to God. So if we're not united, it brings dishonor to God. So are we promoting unity amongst God's people? Then if you look at Romans 15, 13. Romans 15, 13. It says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Paul is praying here that God's people would be full of hope, joy and peace. So are we praying for one another that we would be full of God's hope, God's joy and God's peace? That, that's a specific prayer that Paul prayed. Romans 15 verse 30 to 33. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted by the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and with you, uh, with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with all of you. Amen. So he says in verse 39, I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So Paul is saying to the brethren, please strive in prayer, strive in prayer that I may be successful in proclaiming the gospel against my adversaries so would you say that's the kind of spirit we are in the church well, are we in the western church are we striving in prayer for those who are serving the lord full time see, see that's a good point so are, are we striving for missionaries are we striving for the pastors are we striving for the evangelists are we in are we striving in prayer for those who are doing the work of the Lord in mission. It's a massive challenge that, isn't it? It's really massive, isn't it? So 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 4 and 9. I, I, I'm finding it quite instructive for you looking at these prayers. So 1 Corinthians... Chapter 1, verse 4 and 9. 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 1, verse 4 and 9. 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 4 and 9. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance, and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called unto our fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So what, what's the prayer there? So it, 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 the prayer is thanksgiving in verse 4. Mm -hmm. I thank my God always on your behalf. It's a thanking concerning gifts, verse 5, that in everything you, you are enriched of him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Verse 7, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, and then, so, and there's a, there's, a, there's thanksgiving for a gift and there's thanksgiving for holiness. Verse 8, who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then verse 9, God is faithful, by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So the prayer here is thanksgiving. It's thanksgiving that God has given his people gifts, abilities to serve him, and that in this thanksgiving there is an expectancy of God to confirm his people in holiness and to say that God is faithful in maintaining them in their gifts and holiness. So the implication in this prayer, um, there's, there's a couple of implications that we can deduce, is that we should be thanking God for the gifts that God gives to his people. And that implies we should have an expectancy that God gives gifts to his people. So we should be expectant that God gives gifts to his people and those gifts, i.e. gifts of service, when he gives them, we should thank God for them. We all should, should expect the Holy Spirit to work in God's people and he can keep them blameless, it says in verse 8. 1 Corinthians 1, 8. And that God will maintain his people, God is faithful, verse 9, in the gifts and in the holiness. And we should have a, a, a faith of thanksgiving for these things. So what other practical implication do we get from that, from that prayer of thanksgiving? Because in the midst of a very difficult time in the West with all the apostasy and immorality that we see it's very easy to get cynical but this is teaching us not to be cynical but to expect God to work in his people and to give thanks for that would you say that's it yeah 1 Corinthians sixteen twenty three. One Corinthians sixteen twenty three. So his prayer there is verse twenty three. One Corinthians sixteen twenty three says, "The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you." He's praying that God's grace would go with people. God's grace is so massive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So they need the grace of God to cover them in their life and in their mission. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 7. 2 So we're looking at the prayers of Paul. 2 Corinthians... Uh, chapter 1, verse 3 and 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them who are in any trouble, who by the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of God, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by, by Christ, whether we be afflicted, it is your consolation and salvation which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope is of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so shall you be of the consolation. Any thoughts? Well, Paul is saying, isn't he, that we're to expect suffering. It's part of our Christian life. Suffering is part of our Christian life. And the reason being that we'll know the consolation that abides in Christ. If we didn't have suffering, we wouldn't know this consolation. Yeah, I think I 
I think that's a, a, a logical deduction. But I think in verse 3 it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. Mm -hmm. So he's thanking God, praising God, that when we suffer, we have a God of comfort. Mm -hmm. So the implication there is when a Christian suffers, and like you said, they do suffer, the implication is that God is a com God of comfort who will comfort them. Mm -hmm. uh, and like you said, there's a lot of meat there to, to study concerning suffering. But like you said, there is a lot that is right what you're mm -hmm. saying, yeah. Right, verse 5, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, as our consolation also abound by Christ. So the implication is we thank God for that he's a comfort, but like you said, that the implication is we will suffer. So that's a powerful. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and 16. says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 14 and 16 it says now thanks be unto God who was as caught now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ making manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place For we, are a, for we are unto God a sweet saviour of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the saviour of death unto death and to the, one, the other the saviour of life unto life and who is sufficient for these things. So he says now thanks be unto God verse 14 who always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh Manifest the saviour of his knowledge by us in every place. So I think he's talking about evangelism and outreach. And he's saying that just thank the Lord. Because every time we're doing it, we're triumphant. Whether they accept or reject, thank the Lord, we're triumphant. And how often do we do evangelism, get discouraged because there's not the response that we would hope. But Paul is saying, just thank the Lord, because every time we do it, we're triumphant, whichever way it goes. Any thoughts? Two Corinthians chapter nine, verse twelve and fifteen. Two Corinthians uh, chapter nine. Verse 12 and 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 12 to 15. So 2 Corinthians 9, 12 to 15. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. While by the proving of this man manifest man ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men, and by their prayer for you, who long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. So what do you think that's about? Uh, giving. Yeah. The administration of the service and only supplieth the want of the saints. Yeah. So And then he finishes you know, God God gave his unspeakable gift. So how much should we give our gifts? So
So really, it's thanking God for the fact that some people gave gifts, which then thanks us for the greatest gift of all. But it, 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 it's just prayers for the giving and receiving in the church that God is working in people's hearts and, and God gets the glory for, for inspiring that giving. Mm. So the question is, are we giving? And are we praising God for the giving and receiving of God's gifts? And that it comes from God. Two Corinthians chapter twelve, verse seven and nine. So two Corinthians um, 